Yeah, thank you for having me. Hopefully, can you hear? Yeah. We're good. Everything's good? OK. Um, how's everybody doing? I'm sure you're uh, pretty sleepy. No, no not at all. <laughs> it's been a long day of presentations and talks, I know. So I really appreciate you sticking it out through the end and you know, making it to my presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, so like, you know, like was mentioned, my name is Daniel Dixon. I'm a data engineer with Wells Fargo. Um, and today I'm going to be presenting on a recent use case um, at Wells Fargo that's, that's around fraud that I was a part of. Um, and the main goal of this presentation is to um, convey some of the um, you know, words of wisdom uh, around some of the challenges that we faced in putting a high profile model into production at, at a very large company. You know, some of the things you may not think about um, when you're you know, doing experiments or you know, capital competitions or something like that. There's a lot of, a lot of challenges uh, in getting models, models into production at large companies, um, and rightfully so. Um, so that's, that's the message I'm going to be conveying today. Um, so just a quick note on the agenda. Um, first, going to outline the, the problem that we're trying to solve and the approach that we use to solve it. Um, and then we'll kind of you know, dig into the, the heart of the presentation, which is the, you know, the lessons learned um, kind of broken out by these, these different categories right here. Uh, so just a first note on who we are. Um, uh, in some of my previous roles, I get to work uh, with a variety of different companies from small and large companies. So it's very interesting to see how uh, different companies organize their data science teams and analytic, analytic functions. Um, but at Wells Fargo, we're a very large company, so we have a centralized analytics team, um, which I'm a part of. Um, so we're the um, enterprise analytics and data science team. Um, so we essentially work as internal consultants uh, for our organization. Uh, we're essentially, con we contract out different projects with the lines of business that, uh, that we work with, and we provide uh, a breadth of knowledge across um, you know, different domains, um, and that, that's kind of where we fit in. Um, our, our groups tend to work in, in pods, um, so what that means is we have a handful of uh, data scientists and a handful of data engineers uh, on a team at a time, um, and that model kind of allows us to scale up and scale down with the, you know, the project work that comes in. Um, it allows us to be very flexible with, uh, uh, with you know, moving resources around, um, so you know, joining different pods. Um, and then it also, it, it's, it's a great way to uh, bring on junior members or people that are new to the organization. Um, they can kind of join the pod as, as a junior resource. Um, and then, you know, there's a senior resource who's kind of leading, leading the charge. So uh, for the project I'll be talking about, the Fraud Ops project, um, there were four of us, uh, two data scientists and two data engineers. Um, and just a little bit about me. I uh, went to school at Georgia Tech many years ago. Um, you know, our, our football team isn't very good, but I still root for them. Go Jackets. Um, I had a prior career as a business intelligence consultant for uh, several large software vendors. Um, that's kind of kind of my background before I joined Wells Fargo. Um, and then I'm, uh, I'm an avid hiker, so I actually hiked the entire Appalachian Trail last year. No, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, first I want to outline the problem, um, just kind of go over what we were trying to solve. Um, so just uh, the, the problem we were trying to solve is with debit card transaction level fraud detection. Um, so that, that's a very you know, wide scope problem and, and the problem we were trying to solve was a little more narrow. Um, so if you see the third bullet point, which is you know, kind of red, kind of orange here, um, where it says uh, fraud ops agent queues, that's, that's the problem that we were, we were focused on. Um, so if you think in general about a fraud detection system, um, as transactions are flowing through the system, either credit card or debit card transactions, um, they hit a first line filter. And that a filter in, in real time at scale needs to decide whether we approve or decline these transactions. Um, and that, that happens you know, every day with tens of millions of transactions. Um, but with our model, we're focused on a narrow scope. Um, so there's a subset of transactions um, that are either high risk or um, challenging for a computer to, to figure out. Um, so that those transactions get put on a queue for a human to review. Um, and those, those humans are our fraud ops agents. They go through the queue, they pick off a transaction one at a time, or a case one at a time. They review the details of the case, um, you know, everything that went into it, and then they make a determination on you know, whether the, the card should be closed, whether the customer should be contacted, um, or you know, whether the case just needs to be closed because there may be no fraud there. Um, so our goal with this project was to help prioritize that queue um, so that when our agents you know, went to the queue and pulled a case off the top of it, um, that they're more likely to, to get a fraud case and that they're working 
um, you know, through as much actual fraud as, as possible. So that's, that's where our model kind of fits in with the overall picture. It's not, it's not the frontline um, fraud detection system, um, you know, which is very sophisticated and has its own team around it, um, but it's, you know, it's kind of the secondary level of um, those ones that are more challenging. Um, the solution that we use to this is a GBM model um, in H2O. Um, and for those who may not know what H2O is, it's, it's a technology that, um, that we use to scale machine learning, uh, you know, from very small to very large. Um, so it's very good at scaling those machine learning algorithms. Um, so that's the, that's the technology. Um, and then once we had our model built, we could score those transactions in near real time uh, as, as a model, as a service, uh, you know, infrastructure. So we deployed it into production um, and we, we, score, we could store, score them um, in near real time. And then once we're, we could provide a score to the cases, um, then our agents could go to the queue, sort it by highest score, and then pull off those cases that they need to work um, from you know, top, top to bottom. Um, and just to point out that this, this model is actually in production right now, um, which is, you know, a, it's, it can be a challenge in lar large organizations. It's, it's not something that's, um, you know, that, that you know, is a theory or that we're thinking about. Um, it's actually running. Um, we completed this in my, nine months, which may sound like a, you know, long amount of time for, for some people. Um, but, you know, when you're thinking about a model that affects a, a large amount of customers uh, that might touch, you know, a large amount of accounts, you need to be very rigorous uh, in, your, in your approach. You need to make sure that everything's validated, that you understand what the model's doing, that you have everything documented, you can monitor the model. Um, so all those things kind of, you know, add to the, the, the work that you need to do. So, um, you know, we were able actually to deploy this. Um, uh, and then the approach that we use is kind of a traditional binary classification problem, um, which, you know, sounds fairly straightforward at first. Um, you know, until you realize kind of the, the nuances of, of dealing with data, dealing with historical data, dirty data, um, and, you know, all the, the complexity that comes around with, uh, you know, trying to, to get a nice model table, um, so, you know, and then, and then also dealing with time series data, which is another challenge that, that I'll talk about a little later. Um, so there's a lot of nuance around the problem, even though it sounds like a fairly straightforward modeling problem. Um, the goal is to predict fraud or not fraud. Um, fairly, you know, it's a binary. And then our evaluation metric that we used for this um, was recall at 40. Um, so if you take all the transactions sorted by the, you know, the, the fraud score, um, and you take the top 40%, how much of the total fraud did you catch? What percentage of the fraud did you total catch? Or did you catch? Um, if your data set was completely random, you would expect the top 40% would contain 40% of the fraud. Um, and ideally, you want to do better than that. Um, if you're doing worse than that, then you're, you're doing something wrong. Um, but that, that's the metric we used, and it was tied to uh, a very real world, uh, you know, uh, how, how it happens in, real, in, the, in the real world. Uh, so our agents are, you know, able to work through around 40% of their queue. Um, so we want that, you know, those transactions with the highest amount of fraud to kind of bubble up to the top of their queue so that they're able to, to manually review as many of those as possible. Uh, so just a little bit about the data, the data preparation. Our data is stored in, you know, the Hadoop file system, um, HDFS. Um, so it's, it's a very large data um, and, you know, we, we can, we can kind of scale that data out over our, our cluster of machines. We did our data prep in PySpark, um, which is a distributed computation engine um, and it allows us to, you know, really scale our data or scale our computations up to the size of our data. Um, and, and, you know, this is, this is where my role kind of came in as a data engineer, um, is to take our raw data sets, which are, you know, tens of millions of transactions a day, um, and then all the, the supporting data sets as well, you know, card information, uh, you know, contact information with the customer, and kind of, you know, join all that information together and combine it in a way uh, where we could get a nice model table. So we have the nice features as our columns, and we have, you know, one column as our, our target, um, that's our label. Um, so that's the output of the, you know, our, our data prep section. Um, and then the training, um, we, you know, again, I mentioned we used H2O to do that. Um, we do a lot of work with, you know, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, we use Python to suck the data into H2O uh, to do our, our training. Um, and then once we're kind of confident with, uh, with our approach and what we're doing, we take that code that we wrote in Jupyter Notebooks, um, copy it over to Python scripts, and that way we can have a reproducible pipeline, which is very important because um, you want to you be able to reproduce at any point in time uh, the, the data, you know, from, from start to end um, and, and, and reproduce that model. Um, and it also allows us to do things, you know, like uh, 
uh, you know, uh, version control with our code and do things like code review. Um, so it's very important that we're able to, to automate as much as possible. Um, and then for the production side of things, um, H2O uh, out outputs something called a mojo, uh, which is a file that we can pass over to the model as a service team. Um, and so they can deploy that into production. So at least that part of the project um, was, was very straightforward, thankfully. All right, so now on to you know, essentially the heart of the presentation, which is the, the lessons that we learned um, going through this process. Um, so some of the modeling challenges. Um, so the first challenge is around getting accurate labels, which is a struggle, I think, in a lot of different machine learning projects. Um, so in, in our particular ex example, um, you can imagine a situation where uh, leading up to fraudulent activity, um, there's a lot of um, activity by the fraudster, a lot of activity by the, the customer, um, and all those transactions are declined, the card is closed. Um, so how do you tie the card being closed back to uh, you know, the transactions that, that actually closed it? Which ones are fraudulent, which ones are not? Um, so that, that was, that was a, a big challenge. Um, and you know, the way we solved that, um, we defined, we worked with our business, our line of business partners who really understand the business. Um, and we defined a set of rules using log data, using time series data, um, using you know, uh, things like when the card was open, when the customer was contacted, uh, things like that, to define a set of business rules where we could uh, accurately define our, our labels. Um, so that was our first challenge. Um, the second challenge is around delayed labels. Um, it, it also, you know, it's a, it's a common challenge um, where you don't often know the, the truth value of your, um, of your observation until much later. Um, so in, in our cases, you know, there's certain types of fraud that are caught instantly where we can assign a label of fraud or not right away. Um, but then there's also kind of fraud that doesn't get detected till a couple days, a couple weeks later um, when a customer calls us and say, hey, I think there's been some fraudulent activity on my account. Um, I think these transactions are fraud. Um, so we don't know that until you know, the, the customer contacts us. Um, so we can't make any you know, definitive statements when the transaction happens, whether it's fraud or not, in all cases. Um, so because of this, there's, there's a couple of uh, you know, things to be aware of. Um, the first is when you put your model into production, the day it's put into production, um, you can't measure the model performance until you have the ground truth, until you have those labels that say, was it fraud, was it not? You can't, you can't accurately measure your model performance. So you have to wait until you know, a certain waiting period, X number of days, um, until you can measure your model performance. So that's you know, just something to be aware of. I mean, and then also, because you have to wait, um, that affects uh, how you do your train validate test scheme. Uh, that affects the, uh, the data that you can use for training, because it has to be set back far enough uh, where you can train um, you know, to pass the model and, and start using it in production. Um, so you have to wait X number of days. So the, you know, those are just things to kind of keep in mind. Um, and the last thing, uh, you know, like I mentioned a little bit, is uh, you know, designing a, a time series cross-validation scheme. Um, so you have to be very careful uh, when you're doing your, your test or your train validate test scheme uh, that you're not leaking any information between uh, the different data sets. Um, so in, in our case, our labels are X amount of days in the future. Um, so our validation set can't start until after those labels have been generated, until after X days. So we have our train, we have to wait X number of days, we have our validate, and then we have to wait in, in a similar fashion. So we had this look ahead gap to, not, to avoid leakage, to avoid peaking into the future. Um, and then also uh, we um, did some, some analysis around uh, in sample, and, or sorry, in um, in and out of time samples. Um, so we took some samples from within the training set, and then we took some samples from outside the training set that, that happened after, uh, just to make sure that um, the difference that we're seeing in, in model performance between training and validation uh, is not just due to a distribution shift. So you know, your distribution shifts over time, um, so you, you, know, you wanna make sure that your validation set is not just a different distribution from when your, your training is. So you take some in sample um, within the training period, and you, know, there's, you, you understand that there might be a little bit of data leakage in there, but you can use those metrics to compare it to the out of sample uh, validation set. So you know, just some things to kind of keep in mind, especially with time series data, which can, can be a little tricky. You don't wanna, you don't wanna accidentally leak data um, you know, from your labels. Uh, so some of the, the training challenges we had, um, and you know, these are just uh, you know, things of working 
um, on, on a project at, at an organization. Things come up that you can't anticipate. Um, you know, for example, like we, we had a new uh, platform that we had to migrate to mid-project. Um, our data sources changed mid-training, mid so we had to actually map our data set from the one we were training on to the one we were scoring on. Um, and then our, our access was restricted mid-project. So these are things that, you know, kind of come up um, and you just, you really have to roll with it. You really do. Um, they're unexpected. Um, they can cause you to miss your deadlines, which uh, I hate missing a deadline, but it, but it happens. Um, and, and you just have to, you just have to realize that these are things that, you know, that are out of your control and there, there's only so much you can control. Um, and so do the best on the, on the things that you can. Um, and then just a, a last point here. Um, even though there were some efficiencies in, in what we went through with all these challenges here, um, we were able to shape the, the future of the platform and the processes around the platform that we were working on. Um, you know, we worked very closely with the platform team. We shared uh, the things that didn't work. We, we shared the things that we wished, or wished how, we told them how we wished things would work. Um, and we were able to help shape those, those platforms. So, um, you know, they'll be a little more friendly for data scientists in the future. Um, Um, so just the additional rigor around, uh, you know, a production model. Um, so especially at a highly regulated industry like, you know, finance, um, you, you, you have to make sure that everything, um, everything is validated, everything is double checked, especially things that are affecting, affecting the customer. Um, so we have a model validation team, the model governance team at Wells Fargo. Uh, and their entire job is to take the model that you produce, uh, double check it, um, you know, build some challenger models, um, and, then, and then provide some feedback, to, you know, to your, to your data science team. Um, so the, they require us to, de to develop this model development doc, uh, which is a very lengthy document detailing exactly how your algorithm works, um, how, you're, how you get your input data, where it comes from, just everything, because they, they want to make sure that you know how the model works, and then they, they also want to know how, how your model is working. Um, so that's you know certainly something that you have to you have to kind of go through, um, and then model monitoring. Um, it's it's very key if you uh, you know want to be able to to sleep at night. You need to monitor um, how your model's working in production. Are, are your inputs staying constant? Are your outputs staying constant? The distributions of those. Um, is, is your model performance doing well? Which is you know kind of a separate question, um, and this needs to be automated. This needs to be thought out thought about before the model goes into production. Um, for example, like thresholds of when you might want to investigate whether something's going wrong. Uh, you might want to do a model retraining if you know something's something's too off, um, or you know in in dire circumstances, uh, at what point do you turn off the model? Um, you know those thresholds are very important to think about uh, before you you push the model to production. Um, and then you know, like I mentioned, the lessons we learned here is you know there, there, there's a lot of rigor around this. Um, it, it kind of feels like extra work that you have to do, um, and it's kind of a pain at, at some time, at times. Um, but at the end of the day, your model is better for it. When somebody reviews your model, when somebody questions what you're doing, um, at the end of the day, you produce a better, better model. You have to write down uh, your assumptions. You have to question your own assumptions, um, and, and you just you really have to understand the process. Um, you know, you can't just say. I used this, this package, um, it seemed to be very accurate. You have to describe exactly what it's doing. Um, and, and that just makes for a more, you know, uh, a more, um, a better model at the end. And then, you know, if your model is, is being monitored, you can, you can sleep better at night. Nobody's just giving you calls saying things are going haywire, hopefully. Uh, so some of the challenges in the scoring, uh, so after the model developed is, you know, we, we pushed it to production. Um, you really want to make sure that, um, that your pipeline for generating your features and the production pipeline um, are as close as possible. Um, and it's, you know, it's not always the case that they can be exact, um, just due to performance constraints. Um, you know, they're, they're, those are things you don't have to worry about when you're doing training, um, but in production you have to, you have to meet certain SLAs. Um, but you, you want to try to mimic both those environments as closely as possible. And that, that's something that, that we, we faced as we were going through this. Um, so the, you know, the best thing to do here is um, make them as close as possible. 
Um, what, one of the things that we did that really helped is caching historical features. Um, so in training, we, we, can, we can take as long as we want with training. We can you know, take hours to generate our features. Uh, but if your production needs to return an answer within, you know, with under a second, um, then maybe you need to cache some of those features, especially those features that can be uh, generated the night before. Um, so you know, that, that's something that we did in production. Um, and then H2O, the, the technology we used, uh, it really makes uh, Java-based deployments very easy because it gives you that Mojo file. You can kind of toss it over the fence um, and you know, they, they, can, they can deploy it uh, fairly easily. Uh, and then finally, with team coordination. Um, with our project, we, uh, we, were, you know, contact, or we were coordinating with six different teams. Um, so it's, it really is a group effort. Um, and you know, the, it, it can be a challenge uh, if there's, you know, you want everybody to be informed. Um, you want everybody to, to, to you know, be at the meetings and to know what's going on. But at the same time, it, you know, if your day is eight hours of meetings, when are you going to actually do data science work? So there, there's, a, there's a trade off there. Um, and you kind of have to, to, to balance that. You have to learn when to say no to, to a meeting. Um, uh, so some of the things that we did um, for, for this, uh, we used a lot of tools to, to track our work. So we did something called, uh, something that we called a scrum light process where we used uh, Jira to track our stories. Um, we were using GitHub to you know, do code review and to, to version control our code. Um, we would have two week sprints. Um, and then um, that, that's kind of how we tracked our progress throughout, throughout the project. And, and it, it was also useful for communicating uh, with, with, our, with our partners because um, we could just point them at you know, JIRA and say, this is, this, is where we at. this is where we're at in the progress. Um, Racy chart is something that I was introduced uh, to recently. Um, you know, it, it, for those that don't know, it stands uh, for, for any particular activity who's responsible, who's accountable, who needs to be consulted, and who needs to be informed. Um, so that, that's, if you set that up up front, um, it makes it really easy to kind of track uh, the activities of a project um, and then just make sure that, um, you know, who's at meetings needs to be at meetings and who, who's, uh, you know, who you tell about things is, is the person that needs to be told about. Um, and then, you know, trust your teammates. Um, you know, like I said, there, there were a ton of meetings. Um, and if, if you trust uh, that your teammates are at a meeting and if they need to contact me, that they'll, they'll come and, and let me know. Um, you know that if, and you know, if we're going through a, a scrum process and we're documenting our tasks really well um, and you know, we're, we're com constantly communicating about it, um, then, then you should trust that your teammates uh, you know, are, are doing that their work um, and that it will be reviewed. Um, and so that, that's something to learn. Um, and then just a clear requirements document. I think that's kind of self-explanatory. Um, if, you, if, you, if you clear up front about what your requirements are, then, um, then that just makes the whole process easier. All right, thank you. Daniel, thanks very much. Okay, we've got time for uh, a few questions here. We're gonna go straight to the front of the room first. We'll take one here and then we'll go We'll work our way backwards. Thank you. What is it that makes, Do you want to uh, take the mic there, please? Oh, sorry. Thanks. So what is it that makes an instance, identified instance, challenging? And how is it that a human analyst can do better at figuring out if it's fraud or not than the program, which has access to the same parameters? That, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, our, our fraud model, our frontline fraud models are very sophisticated, and there's an entire team around uh, identifying that. Um, I think there's just a certain, uh, there's a level of uncertainty uh, with any kind of machine learning or any kind of uh, you know rules that you put in place, um, and and sometimes you just need a human to go look at it to to make some determination around um, you know things that machine might not be able to to figure out very easily. Well, give me an example. What what kind of thing can the human see? You know, a disturbance in the force, or uh, you know, what is it that the human bases their judgment on? And how often are they right? And you had a forty percent number. Uh, and you didn't say what the performance of your model was, so it would be nice to know that. False positives also. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I'm allowed to say what the performance of our model is, um, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I, I know. I, I wish I could. I wish we could have a discussion about that, but um, I can't. Um, but you make some good points. You know, what, are, what are the things that humans are better at than, than machines, and, and why, um, why do we need people to go in there and review them at all? Um, I, I just think there are certain situations uh, where, the, where the machine can get it wrong. Um, are they certainly getting more accurate? Absolutely. 
but there's just a certain level of uncertainty when you're when you're making a prediction. Okay. Take one right there. Thank you. Take that. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Daniel. Uh, you mentioned that you put it in this model in production for nine months, and can you briefly share what's the business outcome or impact you guys made, and how often you retrain the model and put it in production? I wish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not allowed to give a lot of details. I have to be generic, and I, I realize that's frustrating. Um, that that I just I can't. Sorry. Yeah. Good. So question further back there. Hi, I'm guessing that the data on fraud is very sparse versus all transactions. So how do you deal with the sparsity in the data when you're building the model? Uh, yeah, great question. How do you deal with the sparsity in the data? Um, we, we did a lot of work in uh, generating features around historical data. Um, so we didn't just use the transaction that was happening to, to make a prediction. Uh, we used a lot of historical transactions as well. You know, how can you predict the, the pattern of behavior for that customer over time? Um, and is the, the, new, the new data deviating from that pattern in any way? Um, so we did a lot of work with, with historical features. Yeah. Okay, we've got, uh, let's take one at the front here and then we'll go there. So down here first, got it, thank you. So as you mentioned, uh, I can imagine the, the deployment to the production will take a lot of the approval or some paperwork. And if you have to make any change on your model, I mean, what's the process and how long it take for you to deploy the change? Sure, yeah, no, no, that's a great question. Um, you, you just wanna be careful because, you know, any, any model that can affect, uh, you know, it can affect the customer, then, then you definitely want to make sure that, that you're doing it right, that there's no mistakes, um, that somebody has reviewed those changes. Um, so when you, when you do, need to do a model retraining, we have to submit, uh, you know, another document essentially. Um, thankfully, it's much shorter than the initial development document. Um, but we have to submit a document saying this is what we did, this is the data that we used, um, this is how we retrained it. And then, you know, somebody from the, the validation team will actually review that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's only certain answers sure. we can get. Yes, <laughs> turn to the side. You mentioned about um, the versioning part of the code. You're using uh, GitHub. Uh, just curious, uh, are you um, any, in any way have any kind of versioning for your actual model? Or even if you do that, uh, how do you correlate with the code or even the data? Yeah, absolutely. Great, great question. Um, yeah, it's it's vital that we can track, um, you know, the data sets that we used, how we built the data, the code that built the data, and then also um, the the model itself over time. So at any point in time, we can go back to an older version of the model and completely reduce it, reproduce it from scratch. That, that's important to us. Um, so we do track our our model files, the the Mojo files in GitHub, um, and then every time we uh, make a deployment, a new version of the model. Um, we tag the entire code base, so the code that built the data, the code that generated the model, and the model itself is, is tagged within GitHub. How about your data? Uh, the, the, we have a, a tagging system for the data as well. Yeah, so we, we use the git commit hash uh, to, to name the data set, essentially. So every time we build a new data set, we tag it, or we name it with the GitHub commit hash that built it. Okay, let's move across to the gentleman in blue there, and then we'll... We'll go right to the back after that. Yeah. Thank you. So no for the questions. training, right, you mentioned that you are using a H2O cluster. Yes. Is it an off-the-shelf product available, or is it your internal thing? Because we don't know. If it's internal, you don't have to say about it. But the reason is, why would you use H2O cluster versus the PySpark cluster for the training? Sure, no, that, that, that's a great question. Um, I'll get into as much as I can. Um, H2O itself is open source. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's, the, that's basically the product that we use. Um, you know, I think there's some, some features that are... Uh, you have to pay for, but in our case, we're just using the open source product. Um, and then the, the question of why would we use that over something like uh, PySpark, um, without, um, without getting into too much detail, um, we, we've just found that Spark is great for, um, j um, for doing your data computations, for scaling uh, your computations, but it doesn't give you as much feedback for the machine learning. Um, so it, it's not built for that, it has features for that, but they're still fairly raw. Um, and you know, I know they're improving with the, with the different versions of it, but we, we've just found that the HTO gives us a lot more feedback, a lot more metrics, a lot more of what we're looking for. Um, so that's why. Okay, let's go right to the back corner there, and then we'll come down to here. 
thank you for that presentation. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, so when you're dealing with uh, a model that has to deal with customer sensitive data, uh, where you know any prediction is kind of in the regulated uh, domain, mm -hmm. how do you deal with you know um, convincing people on your model's accuracy and usage in production? Yeah, th no, that's that's a great question, um, and and I think uh, the main answer to that is to have the person who's measuring the metrics of your model in production be different from the team that developed the model. Um, and so our, our, our case, our line of business partners are the ones who are actually measuring the model performance, and we have no input in how they measure it, um, but you know, th they're, they're separate from us, so they're, um, they want the model to be very predictive. Um, you know, we, we want to be, the model to be predictive as well, but we also just want to get it out. Um, and so I think that's, that's the best way, is just have multiple eyes on it um, and just have multiple different teams looking at it. Okay, someone's holding the mic right here, yes. Um, I assume if you're doing fraud detection that there's a very imbalanced um, data set in terms of the hits and well, the frauds and non-frauds. Um, so did you have to rebalance the data in terms of you know, getting it to a more even amount? And if you did, um, since it's a time series, uh, you looked at a time series type of scenario, um, how did you determine <clears throat> sorry, which, which data to leave out? Because you know, if you leave out certain data, it would take, it would cut chunks in your time series, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I know, I know there was a lot of consideration around the imbalance classes. Um, I don't know the specific approach we used, unfortunately. Um, you know, that was more of the data science realm. Um, I, I know that was taken into consideration. I, I don't remember exactly which approach was used, unfortunately. Um, and then as far as, you know, uh, which data to leave out, um, the, the nice thing is we could use a lot of the historical data. So you have the transaction that's happening, but then you have everything else that happened before that. Um, so we were able to use a lot of that information without, without leaving it out. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think we did a, um, a sampling approach where we left out a lot of the data, um, but unfortunately I'm not really sure exactly which approach we used. Okay, got time for maybe a couple more questions. I see any further hands up. Yes, uh, team white there. Yep. And then we'll come forward a couple of rows. And the last uh, question. Thank you for the talk. Uh, just, I'm not sure if you can reveal this, but uh, was this written in Python? Or if you can say that, or if you can, uh, is there any notable package you think was useful? Uh, yes, it was written in Python. Um, are there any packages that we found useful? Um, yeah, there were a ton of them, you know, especially around reporting and, and graphing. Um, you know, like I said, we, we use Spark, which is you know, a, essentially a Python library, um, and then H2O to do the, the core of our work. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the, the third-party packages that we used. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I don't have a list off the top of my head. All right, just a couple rows in front, we'll take one here. I, uh, I was just curious about the problem formulation. Uh, it, it seems to me like a ranking problem rather than classification, like, because you want the humans to sort of see it in rank order. Sure. Just your comments on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so you're right. It, it is a classification problem, but the output of our model is a score, um, the likelihood of whether it's fraud or not. And so based on that likelihood is how we, we order them. Okay, that was great. Let's take, okay, we've got two more and we'll take two in the center there. So gentleman in white, then gentleman in black, and then that'll be us wrapped up. So let's go further back first. Okay, okay. it's, re right, it's really we'll, quick. We'll reverse the order. Uh, the frontline model has to run in seconds because it's yes, no on the, on the car transaction. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how long it took to run your model? Was length and efficiency even a consideration or did you have the luxury of, of not worrying about that and just throwing as much right. as you could. Yeah, yeah, right. Not being a frontline model, you know, relieves a lot of the pressure. Um, I think our SLA was, you know, under under a second, so we're not getting, you know, into crazy like milliseconds or anything like that. Um, but we, it was a near real time score, so where you know, if you know transactions came in, we want to be able to respond to that fairly quickly. Um, so we want to be able to score those fairly quickly. Um, but yeah, I don't, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly real time.
all of them. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I, sorry, I can't get into to too many details. Um, you can see some of the lines of business that we worked with uh, back here, and then I kind of give you an idea of if I can find that slide back here. Slide, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so this can kind of give you an idea of, of some of the, the the work that some of the work that we do. Um, so we, we work with our line of business partners on, on a lot of the problems that they face. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you for the questions. Daniel, thanks very much for uh, coming in and sharing.